you ever had to kill your sacred cow? You know, the cow that you kind of got all wrapped up on and tied to and cared about and was so consumed with how important it was that you felt like nothing could ever separate you from your sacred cow. This was the most important thing in your life. You know, you've all got them. I've got them. We all have them. We have that overriding passion for something that's ours and not theirs. It's mine and not ours. You know, sacred cows like your favorite church, your favorite pastor, your favorite grandchild, although they're all equal, right? But there's always one that can do no wrong who walks on water, isn't there? Come on. Of course, we all have sacred cows. We have our our favorites. We have our special ones that we pick out and we select as being most important. More important than all the others in some ways. But we don't dare say that. We don't admit we have a sacred cow. We don't try to separate the cow from the bull. Or do we? You see, sometimes God wants you to sacrifice your sacred cow. He wants to take that cow from the altar of your idol worship as he did with the children of Israel when they were standing at the foot of the mountain and they had waited for Moses and they said, Man, where is he? Dude, it's been two days. He isn't coming back. Let's make our own God and let's worship it. Well, they didn't exactly say it quite that way, but they said, Let's have a party. Let's celebrate, man. We, you know, we've been trudging out in that desert for ages. Now we're here. We made it. We've gotten this far. Let's party. And so they did. They decided to throw a big party. And then someone at the party, while they were partying, said, Hey, let's make an let's make a cow. Let's let's make a fatted calf, you know. Because they had no memory <coughs> of their religious upbringing. They had just been slaves for four hundred years. Now during part of that time they weren't quite as bad off as maybe some people thought, but then later they became completely absorbed into the culture. They became like the Egyptians. And so they knew what the Egyptians worshipped. They knew how to worship the different gods. They knew what it involved. And they knew that partying, you always had some kind of focus, some kind of big idol that you set up in front, you know, that you kind of like your rock star, you know. You got to have, in order to have a party, you got to have a band, don't you? I mean, you got to put somebody up there. So, in order to get everybody in the mood, you know, you had to create this, this calf, you know. And so they did. They said, tell you what, we, let's go get Aaron. Aaron knows how to party. I mean, he's one of the, he's one of us. He's not like that Moses, you know. Moses, man, he's just too, too pure. You know, he's always, he's always saying what's wrong, you know. I mean, you know, we need, we need Aaron. Let's go get Aaron. So they went and got Aaron. They said, hey, Aaron, come here. Man, we want to party. You know, people are ready. I mean, we're tired of this. You know, we've had it. We're fed up. You know, we've done all this wandering in the wilderness that we want to. We've gone everywhere. We've done this. We've gotten out of Egypt. And finally, here we are, you know, and Moses is gone. So let's have a party. You know, and so Aaron says, well, you know, okay, does everybody agree on it? Let's vote on it democratically. Does everyone want a party? And everyone said, yeah, party, party, party. Well, Part of the group didn't want to, and they kind of separated themselves, the Levites, you know. They were, they were always kind of Moses' right-hand man anyways, you know, so they kind of didn't agree, you know. They kind of went, uh, no, and they just walked away. You know, they didn't fight with Aaron. They didn't disagree with Aaron. I mean, after all, it's Aaron's brother, of all things, you know. I mean, if you can't control your own family, who can you control? So Aaron, you know, goes, well, okay, we voted on it, so if the people want a party, we'll have a party. And so then they got together with Aaron. They said, "Look, you know, we need to have, we need, you know, we need some tunes. You know, we need to put together some music. You know, we need, we need something to get us in the mood. You know, let's let's make a calf. You know, so everybody will kind of recognize that. You know, of all these millions of us that are out here, you know, we need to kind of put something up on top of a pole or something, or put it up high so we can see it, and everybody will know it's time to party." And Aaron said, "Well, you know, yeah, 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 well, let's vote on it." You know, so they said, "Yeah, we all want we want a fatted calf." You know, because we're going to kill calves, we're going to have a party. Let's have a a party. You know, so we can just celebrate the fact that we've been taken out of Egypt. So 
because they had dwelt in the land of cattle, you know, they kind of went, well, you know, okay, we could put a goat up there, but the goat didn't sound so good. You know, it was kind of, eh, you know, eh, wrong. So they decided on the calf, you know, and they, they built this calf of gold, and Aaron worked on it. And Aaron says, okay, well, you guys go party, and I'll work on this so that we can celebrate, and we'll have our own little Mardi Gras. So Aaron starts working on it, you know, and he's kind of tinkering here and tinkering there. Meanwhile, the people are partying, and they're getting all wound up and excited and beginning to get, as most people do when they get drunk, they begin to get carried away. So they get carried away, and they party for more hours than what originally maybe people thought. Because nobody really says how long completely that it started or how long it lasted, but we do know they got carried away because they started having orgies. They started doing all kinds of perversions. They started doing all kinds of weird things. You know, kind of like you do when you go into a party, you know, and you're partying with the bros. Somebody pulls out some pot or somebody pulls out some drugs, you know, and then you start getting involved. The music's loud, you know, and the, the uh, excitement's there, so you just go, well, I, I just try one. Just, just just one, you know, I just try one, just one little one. You know, and then all of a sudden you're all involved in it. Well, Aaron got involved in it, and sure enough, when he brought the calf, by that time they were already gone. He looked at them and he thought, uh-oh. But he said, okay, well, here's your calf. So he backed away and let them have it. You know, and they, they took their calf and they celebrated and decorated it and did everything they could to it and enjoyed it. And you know the rest of the story. Moses came down from the mountain. He was ticked. He said, what are you doing? God told me you're screwing up. You could have been wiped out, but I prayed for you. And he didn't say that part, but he did pray for them. So when he came down, you know, he said, who is for the Lord and who's, you know, whatever. So Moses says, okay, if you're for the Lord, then you go down and you wipe out these people. And some of them they wiped out. Because, after all, the people had their own fatted calf. You have your fatted calf somewhere? That your little idol that you kind of fashioned with your own hands that you just think can do no wrong? I know that right now, a lot of people have the nation of Israel. You know, They think that Israel is such a wonderful place. It's like Oz. Only, it's Zionist. It's not godly. Israel is a nation in rebellion to God. Israel is a nation that is going to sell its soul to the devil himself, the Antichrist. Israel has spied on and still spies on everyone because anyone that isn't a Jew gets spied on by Jews. No offense, not all Jews, but you know, let's be real. Israel has a spy that they supported here in America in prison because of spying for Israel, Pollard. And they're not letting them out. And if they do, then, boy, that would be a big mistake. Yeah, you know, we kind of like, you know, let that guy go. You know. But the point is this. When people tell me, always on the Internet or Facebook or in life, that we support the right of Israel to exist no matter what, I only ask them one thing. Then what happened at 70 AD when Jesus said, you shall not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He says, destruction will come upon this place. For I would have gathered you unto myself had you accepted me. But because they rejected him, they were dispersed into the entire nations. And God did it. It wasn't man doing it. It wasn't America doing it. It wasn't people doing it. God did it. God dispersed the children of Israel throughout the nations, as he had said he would. And the reason was, was sin. So, because they're still dealing with sin, you know, Yes, I, I read the scriptures. You know, I, I think it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And the peace of Jerusalem is the Prince of Peace. So when the Prince of Peace comes, which he shall, and he stands in the gate, which he will, and he says, here I am. They'll say, well, who are you? And he'll say, I'm the Messiah. And they'll say, well, what are these marks on your hands and feet? And he'll say, these are the wounds that I received in the house of my brethren. And they will mourn and weep and nail and gnash teeth because of mourning for an only son that they have lost and recognize that they failed miserably in all those years, including the ones we live in right now. Because you see, when Israel became a nation, there was a certain amount of kind of like manipulation going on behind the scenes. Now, if you were around at the time, you already know that. There was kind of like, well, it's possible America might be a part of helping them, but they've already made some deals on the side to not help them. And then there were some deals to maybe help them. Then there were some deals to kind of, we've got to do something about it. So it's kind of like, 
Israel was kind of like not really going to get that much support. So it's kind of like a divided America when it came to the supporting of Israel when it became a nation. The same thing happened throughout the long history of Israel. Israel has always been, and if you read some of the books that recently came out, has always been about itself. So don't get confused with your sacred cow, Israel, because Israel is a nation that's Zionist. Even the Orthodox know that it's not a religious nation. It's kind of like when America says we're a Christian nation, it's like, really? <laughs> Where? <laughs> well, we are, you know, in some ways, you know, in some ways, no. That's kind of like Israel, only most ways not, and in very little ways, sort of. So, watch out when people try to get you into wrapping yourself up into some kind of Zionism, you know, because there is no such thing as a Christian Zionism. Zionism is not what you think it is. It is a humanism. Zionism has always been humanistic. It was conceived back in the, uh, way back when, actually, even before 1800s. I was going to say 1800s with Theodore Herschel, but it's even before that. It's a humanistic idea of the evolution of man developing into the greatest that man can be, and it's done in a way that doesn't call it evolution, but it is the same principles that are talked about in the Western culture, but except it's done in Jewish culture, so in Jewish culture it's more treated like well, we accept that you know the Bible is Jewish history, but we don't necessarily go with God because that was just inferior man kind of trying to invent something. So most Jews aren't going to tell you straight, straight up that they don't believe in God, but you're going to find that a whole bunch of Israel doesn't accept God, period. So no offense, I think we ought to witness to Israel as much as we do to everyone else instead of just standing beside them, giving them anything you want, right or wrong. Because Israel is going to turn on America. And they have already, different times, you know, but when they bombed a destroyer and destroyed an American destroyer, a boat, sank it. Oh, so sad, too bad, oh well, our fault. That's sin. That's where the reality of sacred cows will take you. Now, you could be a sacred cow for your church. You know, you think that, oh, my church is so right on. And then suddenly one day, you know, because you've got this wonderful pastor and this wonderful ministry, he goes, ah, uh, you know what? i got to tell you people something. Um, I'm getting a divorce. Yeah, we decided to go separate ways. Where went your sacred cow? You see, it's not because the pastor would be bad, and it may not be necessarily because the church is bad. It could be God is teaching you something about sacred cows. Sacred cows get proffered or offered up as a sacrifice in order to teach the people a lesson. That's what happened at the Mount of... At the mountain, when Moses came down from the mountaintop with God and taught the children of Israel what it means to be holy. If you have chosen to separate yourself from this world, and if you have chosen to separate yourself from the ways of the world and to follow Jesus, you can't afford to be hanging on to some of these wild ideas of, I'm a patriot, first, last, and always, above God. You can't hang on to this Zionism patriotism that I am first and foremost supporting Israel, right or wrong, no matter what. You can't get into all of these entanglements that are going to distract you from what God wants you to do. Because, you see, Aaron failed miserably. And that's a typical of most people that are carnal Christian. But the spiritual Christian was not wasting time. He was halfway up the mountaintop waiting for Moses to come back down. Joshua. Now, you could be a Joshua, or you could be a Moses. But you sure don't want to be an Aaron, do you? And when you get caught up in these, these ideas you have that are so wonderful, and you don't let God show you what they really are, it's probable that down the road he's going to take them and cut their throat, drain the blood, cut them up the middle, throw them on the altar of sacrifice, and eat part of it, but wipe out the rest. Because once you start looking a little closer at that idol you've made out of whatever your pet idea is, you find out that, no, your husband isn't perfect. No, your wife isn't the most gorgeous woman in the world. No, your children don't walk on water. 
No, your church isn't the perfect church. No, America isn't the greatest nation in the world. And no, there isn't such a thing as Israel is always right and never wrong. And no, there isn't this idea that right or wrong, we stand beside them, irregardless of what God may tell us to do. Our prayer has always been to follow Jesus. And that's what yours is, to follow Jesus. So that you would be like Moses going up the mountaintop and bringing back the salvation of God unto the children of Israel. Which is what our first commandment was, to go out to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, teaching them about Jesus. I don't know about you, but I don't see so much of that going on nowadays. I see a lot of people supporting Zionist organizations that have promised not to witness Jesus to the Jew. I see a lot of Christians supporting Christian organizations that have promised we will not proselytize to the Jew in Israel. We will not share Jesus and salvation to the Jew. And yet, what have you done lately for a Jew? Do you have a sacred cow where it's all about taking care of our people first and maybe not God's people? Maybe it's not God's people, but we're all one and that we're called to be one. That we're called to be no longer Jew or Gentile. We're called no longer to be Israel or America. We're no longer called to be Russia or Iran. We're no longer called to be Muslim or Mormon. We're called to be children of God. And God wants to bring us to that place by repentance, by acknowledging the sacrifice that Jesus did and paid the price for on the cross for our sins, and by walking in fellowship with Him all the days of our life that we would not be like the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness, acting upon instincts that have been influenced by the world, but rather we would be like Moses walking with God, talking with him and following what he says to do, and not like Moses striking the rock and getting mad, but like Moses listening carefully to what God has to say and doing what he tells us to do. And the reason why we have devotionals is because we want to do that all day long. We don't want to pick up a study once a week, you know, and twice a week and say, hey, you know what, man, now I can check out the rest of the time, you know, and be on my own. No, we want to be devoted to God continually. So all through the day and all through the night, we dwell on His promises, we walk in His light. Darkness shall flee at His command. All through the day and night, we're in His hand. So let us walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship one with another. But don't let us put our sacred cows in front of each other because I'll be the first one to take the knife and cut your sacred cow by the throat. And I'll watch it bleed all over your theology. Because every sacred cow that I've ever had, God has removed from my life. Completely. <laughs> and he didn't allow me to keep those because he wanted something better. Instead of a sacred cow in front of my eyes, I have a sacred son whom I look at and I find in the name of Jesus so beautiful that he's called Wonderful Counselor, Marvelous. He's called the Prince of Peace. He's called, oh, a man acquainted with sorrows. He's so tender. He's so gentle. He's so real that I would not deny myself the opportunity to spend time with him and to look over at a sacred cow and go, you want me to go play with what? A cow? I don't think so. You want me to go to Israel and kind of like worship the ground that, by the way, it's six feet under and it isn't on top of where you're walking. You think you're walking because it's down below the level that you're walking. They built on top of it. Then they made it a tourist attraction. I lived in Israel. You know, I know what the Israeli is like and I know what the nation is like and I know what the politics is like. And it was like, wow, talk about this is why we don't do democracy because it don't work. <laughs> Every time they disagree, they shut down the government. Yep, break it up. All well, parties didn't agree, so guess what? Got to have a new vote. Can't do anything until then. Wipes out democracy completely. Netanyahu will tell you that. But when the time comes that Israel is going to completely turn their back on God to build a temple, 
that is not something we worship. We're not going to a temple in Jerusalem to worship. I am not going to tell you that, oh, get all excited and spend all your money on this temple being built. That thing's going to be like an abomination to God because guess what's going to happen? His presence will not be there. That is a temple for Jews. It's not a temple for use. <laughs> you have a temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have that temple inside you. You are a holy nation, a holy convocation. You are going to heaven's temple, the new Jerusalem, not the old. So put away the sacred cow. Don't get into old Israel as it's being reborn right now but rather get into new Jerusalem that's coming and new Israel that will be in the kingdom so that we would witness now to the Jew and to the Israeli all that live in the land. For this is my desire that all of Israel would be saved and that we would impassion ourselves to not be stuck with defending her or it, but rather witnessing to them that now you know that God protects you. Now you should see that God is on your side. There should never be this idea that we need to stand with Israel. It should always be God is with Israel when they turn to God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. It should never be our byline that we take the place of God. And yet, sacred cows, you have them, I have them. Israeli Zionism is one of them. Zionist groups are pushing it, promoting it, talking to you, taunting you, involving you, and most of those Zionist organizations do not believe in God and will not support you when you say you are witness to a Jew. They will not witness to the Jew. Jew will not proselytize Jew. Except, oh, wow, wait a minute. What about Jews for Jesus? Oh, they've been witnessing to Jews for a long time. Oh, what about chosen people? They've been doing it for over a hundred years. And they're still doing it. What about all these Jewish Christian organizations? Not Jewish Messianic. Be careful of that because there's a lot of Christians calling themselves Jews and Jewish Messianic or Messianic Jews, whatever they want to call themselves, that are really messing things up with people because then they don't know what's going on. Trust me, <laughs> the Messianic movement is a mess. But the different aspects of it that we're trying to be taught was good. You know, some worship, you know, some... Jewish roots, but you don't want to keep your nose in the dirt, you know, and you want to move forward and go up into the fruit. So you kind of want to, you know, enjoy some of the root, but you want to be in the fruit. You get it? The picture? You know, kind of, yeah, it's nice to know some of your roots, but it doesn't mean that you want to stay there. Sorry. <laughs> Once you know, then you go on back into the branches. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. You're not the root. <laughs> Let people that are roots stay in the roots, you know, because believe me, you don't want to be in the dark down there underground. It's an underground scene. No comment. The point being is that as we know that we ought to follow through with these things that God has told us to do, should we not be then faithful to Him rather than to our idea of a person? In other words, a sacred cow can be Tim Tebow. It could be your football team. It could be your school. It could be your rock star. It could be your Christian artist. But when you make them sacred, and you lift them up, you're only doing one thing. And one thing alone. When you lift someone up, when you lift them up so high, or any height at all, you're making them fall. Because they will fall. And how high or how far they have to fall to hit the ground is directly proportionate to how high or how far you lifted them up. Jim Baker and the PTL Club had a good idea when they started. Nice ministry, nice idea, man of God, woman of God, and look what happened. Sad. A tragedy. And yet, almost the entire Christian world was involved at PTO. And people won't admit it nowadays, but they were. You can go back and look at the records, I remember. And the shame of it all is that when things get lifted up, like an idol, God brings them down. But when things humble themselves, when they act in a way that God is pleased with them, He lifts them up. Israel is not lifted up before our eyes. Jesus is. For if we would lift Him up, He would draw all men unto Himself. So our message isn't about Israel and supporting Israel. Our message is about supporting Jesus and His cause for the entire world. 
For this is the reason that we were existent, that we should share the Jesus that we know, the Jesus that saved us, and the grace that made us into the people that we are today. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. For as much as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. I would say that directly to Israel today, and to every Israeli, and to every person that is over in Israel. I mean, I witnessed in Israel. Believe me. Challenging. But I did it. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God. There is none else. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. In Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off are made close by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. By his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained an eternal redemption for us. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The beauty of what Jesus has done in heaven is that he represents all of us as he stands before the holy God, and there is none other. I mean, sure, it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but you know what I'm saying the Holy God, there is none other, that as he does present himself before God, he is that propitiation, he is that high priest, he is that covered by the blood. There's a person that I was sharing with that, you know, unfriended me, which is normal. I was like, oh, that happens. Told me that, you know, I needed to splash the blood all over myself and run into the holy place, you know, and start splashing and dashing and, you know, claiming and naming or whatever it was that, you know, somehow I had to take the blood, you know, and use it. And I said, I don't have to do a thing. I said, I don't go into the holy place. I said, Jesus does. I said, Jesus entered once into the holy place and he has done it for all time. He doesn't need to keep going back and splashing blood around. That person disagreed with me. I said, well, you know, okay, you know, maybe you do, but, you know, the blood of goats and bulls have no ability to remove sin or the stain of sin from my life, but the blood of Jesus Christ having been shed once continually removes that stain or that consequence of sin in my life so that I am presented before the Father by Jesus faultless and with exceeding joy that he would one day present me my spirit to be completed as though I had no sin at all and that he would make me at one with him and at one with the Father and so I tried to explain a little bit, you know, and the person was like, no, man, I'm in the blood. You know, they wanted to swim in it, they wanted to drink it, they wanted to take it, they wanted to make it, you know. And Pentecostal people kind of get a little carried away. But see, for that person, their sacred cow was blood. They were into this blood, this, blood, that, blood everywhere, you know. And I'm, well, you know, sounds like a bloody mess to me. <laughs> and I understand, you know, where they're coming from, but I don't go to the place of, saying or agreeing if it's wrong. You know, I mean, if a person says, look, I'm telling you this is what the scripture says, I say, well, okay, then just show me. You know, I don't have a problem with any scripture you show me because I'll just either add the part before it or add the part after it and it'll explain it because that's what's happened every time on the Facebook pages or on the internet with me. A person will misquote some scripture and I'll say, okay, well, here's what I see it saying. Here's the beginning of it. Here's the end of it. Let's put it all into context. They put it into context, and I think once I've had a person come back and say, thank you. <laughs> but everyone else reading it, I'm sure, went, he's right. You know, that's not about right or wrong, but he's, he's right. The scriptures do say that. The scriptures themselves define themselves. And that's where people will take their sacred cow idea, and but based upon one scripture, will make it into something it's not. And though for centuries they sang, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, and saying about the blood, the blood, the blood. It's important. Don't get me wrong. It does. And we take communion to identify the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And we declare till he comes again, his coming again, by doing so. We do it often so that we would remember him and the sacrifice that he's done. Because he is the body broken 
and he is the blood shed for the new covenant. But it isn't like going into a temple. <laughs> Which I tried to explain first. I said, first of all, you know, you don't go into a temple and you start splashing things around. I said, it just, it just, it's not that way. I said, the holy place is holy. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, it's not like a Pentecostal, you know, tabernacle. You know, where you're rolling around on the floor, or jumping down, down, and shouting and screaming and. You know, barking and doing this and doing that, throwing gold dust in the air and saying, "Oh, look, it's God." <laughs> okay, you know, sure, right, gotcha. But you know, the point being is, we have the scriptures in order to identify if we've caught up ourselves into some sacred cows that maybe at some point in time God's going to take that cow and <laughs> slit its throat. And you watch. Now that I've shared this with you, I don't want to say count the days, but boy, soon Israel will probably make some kind of statement, action, do something that you won't like, and your sacred cow, Israel, and Israeli, will suddenly be devastated before your eyes. It's kind of like when the Israelis were stealing body parts. You know? I mean, it kind of got busted, and it was partially true. They were not harvesting, but there was a certain amount of usage of body parts being used back and forth by different people at different times for particular reasons. But whenever people get into these like sacred cow things, it's like they are willing to say, we should not do stem cell research because it's harvested eggs from, you know, um, it was harvested stem cells from aborted fetuses. What do you think Israel does? Israel is number one. Where do you think Technion gets its developments from? How do they come up with all these genetically modified fruits and vegetables? Israel leads the way in everything that Christians say they don't want today in America. But that's where you know it's a sacred cow because, you see, nobody brings that up. But everybody knows it. Who invented the genetic crop? Where did it come from? Israeli scientists, by the way, you know, you got a you got a award for that too, and he came over to America and introduced it. Really? Wow. Yeah, you know, I mean they've been doing that for shoot ever. <laughs> or other quote unquote cloning? Who's leading in cloning? You don't want to know. So don't get caught up in the world and its idealisms and your own misconceptions because if you take more information in, and that's why I work on the internet and I do a lot of internet news and I do a lot of Bible study, you know, I mean, Bible, when I say Bible study, I mean Bible study, you know, not just, you know, like, well, yeah, I got a Bible, you know, and I got a commentary, you know, or I got 12 commentaries laid out. No, I mean, like, going out and finding out, you know, the different places and locations and finding out the archaeological background and, you know, whatever the text says and then bringing the text in and then whatever the different disagreements were and the agreements are and then where the you know, balance of the scripture could be and how God in his big picture incorporates all of that and still is able to fulfill all of it in his purposes and his design especially based upon the individual person depending upon where they are from their perspective and looking at it from maybe 40 different points of view and seeing how well that each one of them could still have a part of the truth and we could still come to salvation by way of if they just keep continuing on in their way they may go a long way around and they may have to go through tribulation and go through some other experience but if they did live long enough and they had to go through that personal experience like they did with the children of Israel did from the beginning of Genesis all the way through the tribulation and then actually gone through the tribulation and wind up into the millennium and then wind up actually blessed by God because then they find out that the plan of salvation had already been worked out from the beginning from Genesis all the way through the prophets and the law and that each individual circumstance was always made out to be so that they would be an example to the believer that they should live after not like the way the children of Israel did throughout the entire book of Revelation and the Genesis all the way through the volume of the book but that they would see that Jesus was the simpler way and that all they had to do was have a personal relationship with him in the beginning and they would have all the way through the end and they would have walked with him and talked with him and been with him all the way through so that they would not have rejected him when he came and then we would have been with him in the book of Revelation they would have to have gone through it they would have been raptured and then they would have gone back came back saved Israel to the nations and the whole entire world would have been blessed because they had seen the children of God that you are see that? Simple. Bible study. You got it, right? Play it back slow and see if I made a mistake. Chuck Smith one time blessed my socks off. He inspired me. I mean, he just, he always did, but you know, he inspired me. He started one night, Sunday night study. He started in Genesis and he told the plan of salvation in every book. In Genesis, he said this. In Exodus, this 
in Leviticus this and just went boom 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 in one long timeline storyline that went all the way through every book of the Bible and I went when I got done I went that's cool <laughs> I went home and prayed I mean I was like man it's cool you know I was like that's so cool and it was because you know usually most I always like to tell people that the legacy of Calvary Chapels is that you know your Bible you know meaning that you, you, you got this time frame and this sphere of understanding the entire volume of the book you hopefully you used to be anyways so I was all stoked about this I thought man that is so cool and I went on with that my sacred cow so to speak went on with that for a long time I mean it must have been years you know and I never tried it and then one day I forget, somebody came over to my house, you know, maybe it was a Jew. I think it was a New York Jew one time. He came over and we started talking and all of a sudden I started from Genesis and went all the way through to Revelation. And I went, that was God's way of slaughtering my secret cow without having to cut his throat. <laughs> I was like, I could do that. He used me. Because I was so, pardon me, but with my self-esteem in those days, I was so humble. <laughs> People still think like I'm full of pride or something. It's like, oh, please. Watch me in action, man. I'll walk right out there and smack myself into a tree or a wall or, you know, do something stupid, you know. So I'm not, I'm not full of pride <laughs> or ego. It's like, yeah, come on, now, give me a break. I still get up in the morning, you know. I know what I look like. But um, anyways, I was so thrilled about that, you know, that God had given me that, you know, complete retelling of the story of God from Genesis through Revelation that I thought, this is how they do it, do it, this is how they do it, do it, this is how they do it, do it. And I was stoked. <laughs> and I thought I was something, you know. Not really, but you know, the point being is that he did the same thing, you know, I mean he was probably a little more in depth from a Jewish perspective, but you know, his his reform perspective was better than mine. I was talking to him a little bit from Hasid's and he was talking to me from kind of a conservative reform perspective and then kind of an overview overlay of how in like New York and how kind of East Coast Jews kind of treated things, you know. And me, I was kind of like, you know, well, yeah, from West Coast, you know, so I had all these other things. You know. But uh, it was interesting, you know, because when I got to you know, I, I did have an analogy of the sacred cow thing, you know, and God spoke to me kind of calmly, you know, it's like, Michael, you know, this is, this is what we mean by sacred cow. You know, this is how you could get so carried away with elevating someone that you think is so special or doing something when it's just me. And I felt so, not deflated, but so humbled in, in a tenderness. I felt so tenderized. I felt so tender towards the Lord at that moment. It was like, wow, when he said it's just me, I knew because I could see Chuck Smith's face and I knew that it was Jesus, that it was Jesus in him that had done that. And I went, oh, you know, and I was like, oh, Lord, it was you. And I was like, no, no, no. I was all teary-eyed, you know, and I was like, no, no, no. I get that way with God at times. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> Don't you? Well, don't have any sacred cows. Make Jesus not your sacred cow, but your sacred person. And you'll find that as you make him your all, he'll introduce you to his father. And then you'll incorporate worshiping father with the son. And then because the spirit's involved, oh, you're never really going to understand that one because nobody really does. I mean, come on, let's be real. Every time they try to explain to me the Holy Spirit as a person, I say, you know, that's an anthropomorphism. <laughs> Don't tell me it's a person. I understand the personage thing. I understand the person thing. I understand the Godhead. But there's a lot that you, you know, we don't know. And you got to admit that part. And they go, no, oh, no, 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 Michael, you just want to argue. I said, no, I don't. I just want to tell you that it doesn't say it that clearly, or it's not quite that. Because I don't know him that well. I know he is, and I know what he is, and who he is, and how he does, and what he does. But Believe me, there's more that I don't know than I do know, and there's more not said than is said. But they just kind of, you know, kind of. And I'm not going to go that it's not a trinity, because I am a triune, triunity, trinity, echad, completeness of God, Godhead, you know, Father, Son, Spirit. So, I'm not a heretic. 
but I do know that spirit is still kind of <laughs> something there, <laughs> not quite all there, you know. <laughs> but in rejoicing over that with which we've been given, it's fun to get involved in supporting Israel. It's fun to get involved with your sacred ideas, you know, like your Christian artist or your your favorite rock star or whatever it may be. But the problem you'll find is only when you take it to not just the extreme, but when you take it too far. And if you don't involve Jesus in it, and Jesus isn't with it, then you're going to find that because you don't see Jesus in it, that should have been the warning sign immediately that he walked that way and you went that way. Sure sign of the sacred calf. And I find it all the time because as soon as I talk about Jesus, the person is talking about their sacred cow. Let that be a lesson to you. May it be an instruction for both of us to watch out for our sacred cows because I have mine, you know. I mean, I thought emotional was going to be the devotional. Well, it's the e devotional, you know, the e version, you know, the internet version, and blah, blah, blah. And it was like, you know, there was no. There was life in it, you know, I mean, God blessed it, but it was like, for me, between the Lord and I in our private times, our quiet times together, where I just walk with Him, and we kind of, kind of spend some, uh, you know, quiet times. It's, you know, just kind of, what do you think, Lord? I was like, no. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, it's like, okay, and I moved right on. You know, it's kind of like I had gotten kind of too much into whatever it was, you know, with the emotion. So it was like, the Lord said no, and I went, okay. So we tried Proverbs 3, 5, 6. I said, well, Lord, you know, I'm always trusting in you, and I ran with it, you know. And it didn't last very long at all, because I didn't even bother praying. I ran with it, and I was like, okay, God said no. And when video came up, it was like, wow, Lord, that's cool. That's you. And it was like, and that's why I still go. <laughs> so let that be a lesson for you of my own application of that with which God has just shown us today. In knowing that there is one God, one mediator between God and man, and man and Christ Jesus. And let nothing, whether it's some favorite song, psalm, theological idea of blood of Jesus, or Israel as a Zionist nation, that somehow you've got to support them and protect them and you know guide them and do whatever, when it's only said that you should pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you should bless them, you know, as you can, but not bless them when they're wrong, because you don't bless sin, pardon me. You don't curse them when they're wrong, because you don't curse sin. You curse the one that tempted them to go into the place that they did when they tempted, were tempted and fell away from that with which they were supposed to do. So you don't curse someone that, you know, is needing forgiveness, but you witness to them with Jesus. And that's how we bless Israel, by giving Israel the Messiah. So if you would bless them, don't send them your money. Don't send them some, you know, tearjerker response to some, you know, idea of, you know, like, oh, poor Israel, the ministry has just worked out so bad for them, you know, over there. You know, they got so many people and they don't have enough money. Baloney, they got wealthy people over there. Trust me, I know. They could take care of everybody. No problem if they want to. You know, I know how it works. Believe me, I've seen where it was like the ghetto side and the prosper side, you know, and I went, okay. Orthodox, may a shrink, yeah, come on, let's work this out. In all you do, seek the Lord, and whatever he tells you to do, that you should do.